Officials in Mexico and the United States are celebrating after someone by the name of El Chapo, Joaquin Guzman, has been captured. He is the head of the Sinaloa drug cartel, and they've been looking for him for over a decade. What does this mean? We have a video explaining more. Tonight, U.S. law enforcement is hailing the arrest of the top drug dealer in the world after hunting him for more than a decade. There he is, the man known as El Chapo, a.k.a. Shorty, who runs the world's largest drug cartel, in handcuffs, surrounded by Mexican military officers. Joaquin Guzman Lira, the leader of the Sinaloan Mexican drug cartel, finally back in custody after 13 years on the run since bribing his way out of prison. How powerful El Chapo's cartel is believed responsible for an estimated 25% of the drugs entering the U.S., marijuana, cocaine, heroin. Tens of thousands may have died in the U.S. and Mexico because of him through overdoses and associated murders. I love the editing and the sound effects in that video, <laughs> uh, but let's go ahead and talk about the actual content of it. So, Dave, it yes. looks like we won the war on drugs. Oh, my God. The war on drugs is over. I have to say, personally, this is very depressing because I have El Chapo's number in my phone, and he used to be my weed guy, and now I have to go to one of these dispensaries in Damn. L.A. I felt so edgy when I was dealing with El Chapo personally. It was like Breaking Bad. Um, <laughs> Yes, this, this, look, this is like the, the terrorist argument. You know, if you kill one guy, well, then the snake just grows another head. This is going to affect nothing. We can keep chopping these people down. But as long as there's a market for drugs, and there's always going to be a market for drugs, and as long as our war on drugs is backwards, which is seemingly always going to continue, then uh, there's really no way of stopping these people from coming and, and continuing to push the drugs and make the drugs and all that. To yeah. your point, the second in line at the Sinaloa drug cartel said, you know, if you guys take him down, it's fine. Uh, we have someone ready to replace him. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. He, yeah. That's absolutely true. Um, what I find so interesting about this guy is he somehow managed to escape from prison in a laundry truck back in t uh, 2001. So, <laughs> and, and so there are some conspiracy- I love Lucy, isn't it? It's <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, there are some conspiracy theories about how uh, politicians had, had helped him escape, uh, some officials helped him escape, which it could be entirely true. We don't have any concrete evidence on that. But again, I mean, this isn't really anything to celebrate. This guy was a hideous human being. He ordered the decapitations and the deaths of so many people as a result of this war on drugs. But in terms of solving this issue of drug addiction, I mean, this does absolutely nothing. No. Yeah, no, the, the comparison to terrorism is great. It's like whenever they kill the number two Al-Qaeda guy in Yemen, which would be awesome if there was ever a number three guy who's like, I like my position in the company. I'll stay right here. <laughs> right. It doesn't actually happen that way. Never happens. Um, That's a good accent. Was thank good. you, I try. I don't know what country it was from, but uh, and speaking of country of origin, that guy in his little like picture with the gun, could he look any more like a U.S. militia leader? Like he's running around in, anyway. Um, they can, look, they have to do their criminal justice side of the war on drugs as long as they're maintaining it. And look, capturing him is better than not capturing him, I suppose, unless the next guy in line is even worse in some way. But I'm not concerned about the, the capturing them. I think that the only way that you're going to do anything about drug, drug addiction is uh, teaching people about it, giving them uh, the resources necessary to break it if they want to, and improving the conditions in the U.S. such that less people will feel the need to get addicted to drugs in the first place. That's absolutely true, um, but I should note for the audience that weed was not the only thing that he was pushing. He was mm -hmm. pushing um, methamphetamine, heroin, some very, very serious drugs. Now, I would make the argument that even though those are hard drugs and you know the, the ramifications of taking those drugs are hideous, you got to legalize it and you got to create uh, programs where people can re rehabilitate themselves should they choose to do that. Now, Brendan, that sounds very, very radical to a huge portion of the population here in the United States. Do you think that public opinion will ever shift toward legalizing all drugs, much like they did in Portugal? Well, so, I mean, we're already seeing progress in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so now 60% of Americans across the country uh, support the legalization of marijuana. And I think there's an, a growing consensus that we need to treat this as a public health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. Um, you know, I think the prohibition itself, and I think that the ACLU agrees with me mm -hmm. on this, uh, the prohibition itself is the problem. You know, alcohol prohibition created Al Capone, um, but when was the last time that you saw Jack Daniels and Johnny Walker go to war over a turf dispute? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's absolutely true. Um, but w do you think that there is a profit motive to keep these types of drugs illegal? 
I mean, yeah, to, without sounding like a conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Corrections Corporation of America, kind of the privatization of private prisons as a general matter, you know, there were huge financial incentives to keep drugs illegal. Um, burn grants uh, from the federal government that go to local law enforcement agencies who carry out the drug war, um, and all of that, you know, goes into kind of fueling the lobbying efforts behind keeping drugs illegal. I also think we shouldn't dismiss the fact that so much of the violence is happening in Mexico and not here. Not to say we don't have plenty of drug violence here, because we do, mm -hmm. but decapitations and the amount of killing and all that, this is happening in Mexico. We're a little different when it comes to the violence that's happening beneath our border. Uh, rather than happening in our border. And if some of this stuff was happening here, maybe you would see a little bit of change. But then again, it would also be happening in communities that people wouldn't be talking about a lot. Absolutely. So you may not see that much change. Well, you know, to your point, uh, in Mexico, since 2006, when President Calderon launched this war on cartels and drugs in the country, uh, more than 70,000 people have been murdered. And I'm talking about, you know, shot decapitated, displayed for people to see, so they are afraid and intimidated by these cartels. I mean, it's a terrible situation in Mexico, and that's not to fear monger or, or say that it's happening throughout all of Mexico, but it is a really big problem in border towns, and the only way you're gonna take power away from the cartels is if you take away that one resource, the one thing that they're selling people, People are going to want drugs. You want to rehabilitate them. You don't throw them in prison. You give them rehabilitation. Yeah.